Duly Noted, a health and care podcast is the official podcast series of Duly Health and Care. Each podcast features physicians or team members discussing groundbreaking topics and innovations that help listeners reimagine and better understand an extraordinary health and care experience. While there is no cure for diabetes, there are ways to successfully prevent and manage the disease. And today we will go through a few tips you can take with you to continue living a healthy and well life. Joining us for this conversation is Laura Hamilton, a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. So Laura, to start us off today, how can making these small lifestyle changes, such as adopting a healthier diet and increasing physical activity, help with the prevention and management of this disease? Well, lifestyle is really dramatic as far as improving diabetes and blood sugar management and for the prevention and for the management of type 1 or type 2. You know, there was a huge study done years ago, and it was called the Diabetes Prevention Program, and it took people with prediabetes, so those people that were high risk of developing diabetes, and they put them into different groups, and they followed them over three years, and they put them into a lifestyle change group as one of the groups, and they lost about 7% of their body weight. They were exercising about 150 minutes a week, and then they changed their eating habits. And then they put the other group into a medication group, a metformin group, um, to try to prevent diabetes. And they followed those people over time. And what they found was that the lifestyle group really dramatically reduced their chances of getting diabetes by about 58%. And that that was greater than even the medication group. The medication group decreased their risk of developing diabetes as well, but it was by 31%. So that was kind of a breakthrough study that they're still following those people as well, showing just the benefit of exercising, healthy eating, and weight loss on the management of especially prediabetes and type 2. Well, let's focus on diet first. What specific modifications can be made here to prevent diabetes or improve their current diabetic condition, whether they are pre-diabetic or have type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Sure. Well, diet is is huge, right, in in helping control blood sugars because what we eat directly impacts our sugar. And so we definitely know one of the first things we look at is what people are drinking, right? Because drinks can be just such a huge hidden source of sugar and carbs and They can have pretty drastic and quick impact on blood sugars, things like regular pop, even, you know, juices. People think juice is healthy, but that's something that can really raise blood sugars, along with things like sweet tea, lemonade. There's all these new, you know, coffee drinks and sweetened refreshers and and those kind of things. Even people think they're trying to be healthier, they're lighter. We really know that those have a lot of sugar and calories contributing to high blood sugars and weight gain, too. So that's one of the first things we look at. But we just want to, you know, get people eating less processed foods as well. In general, you know, we know that a healthy diet includes eating more real food. So that means shopping more on the perimeter of the grocery store where the real food is, eating definitely more fruits and vegetables with vegetables, most of those being free foods. We know they're so good for us and they don't have an impact on blood sugar and provide so much nutrition. And most people aren't eating enough of those foods, as well as fruits, nuts, seeds. You know, those are some good sources of healthy fats that we know can be filling and and good on cholesterol, these healthy fats, things like avocados and olives as well. And if we continue on the perimeter of the grocery store, we have meats. We want to focus on lean meats, heart-healthy meats, things like chicken and turkey and fish for a source of protein, and then eating less from the the middle of the grocery store, right? That's where we see a lot of our packaged foods, processed foods. A lot of those are fried, things like chips, even things like pretzels. Sometimes people think those are better because they are not fried, but they still contain a lot of white flour, which we know the white flour can impact blood sugars a lot more. So we are encouraging more whole grains, high fiber choices when people are eating. So things like a whole wheat bread over a white bread maybe like brown rice or quinoa over white rice, maybe a whole wheat cracker over saltine crackers. So trying to choose these healthier carbs that have fiber, things like beans and legumes and lentils as well, those are going to be better choices for carbohydrates. And that fiber, what it does is it fills us up more, and it also doesn't have as quite of a high as a spike on blood sugars too. So a lot of benefits to, to eating more real foods, more fiber, less processed foods, less sweetened drinks, or just, you know, some some of the basics to start with. 
Great. Well, what about the physical activity aspect then? How much and what type of physical activity do you recommend for diabetes prevention? For those that are pre-diabetic and for those with type 1 or type 2 diabetes to improve their conditions. So the general recommendation for most people with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and pre-diabetes is about 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity. So that could be walking. Walking is great. You know, people underestimate the, the power of walking. You should be walking at a good pace that you're pushing yourself a little bit, you know, not just strolling. So walking, swimming, biking. And that was 150 minutes a week. So if you break that down, that's about 30 minutes, five days a week. And we don't really want to go more than two days without physical activity. We just know that that's so beneficial on the body that we want to try to get into these habits as well to give that that benefit, you know, most days of the week. But five days for sure would be a good goal. And with that being said, I would say physical activity is is challenging for a lot of people. You know, some people can really get into the healthy eating aspect, but they struggle with the activity. That recommendation, 150 minutes a week. But I also tell people something is better than nothing, you know. So if you only have 10 minutes in the morning, you know, you can get a quick walk in. And this exercise can be divided. It doesn't have to be like 30 minutes at one time. You could do 10-minute walk in the morning. You could take a 10-minute walk at lunch and do 10 minutes, you know, after dinner. We know people are busy and time is precious, but your, your health is precious too. So we really encourage people to try to make exercise and activity more of a priority and to also find something that they enjoy. You're more likely to stick with something if, if you are enjoying the activity. And, and that really varies among people because some people will tell me, oh, I, I need to be with a group. I need to be, you know, with a group exercise. Some people tell me they just want to be in their home and they need the convenience of doing it at home because they don't have time. You know, whatever works for people is great. And, and often I'll, I'll also get asked, like people will say, what's the best time of day to exercise? You know, that's a big question. And my answer is always, whenever you will do it. The benefits of exercise are so great that whenever you're going to do it, you're going to reap the benefits. And and there's so many benefits, right? You know, I tell people constantly that exercise and activity is like free medicine. And especially for people with diabetes or prediabetes, we know with type 2 and prediabetes that they are experiencing insulin resistance. And that's kind of the driving cause of type 2 diabetes is that the insulin, which is a hormone that comes from their pancreas, is released after we eat. And in diabetes, the insulin isn't working like it should. Insulin, we say, kind of key role is to unlock the door to our cells, to let sugar into our cells for energy. And so in prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, they're making this insulin, but it's not like doing its job. It's not acting like the key to unlock the door to let sugar in to the cells for energy. So instead, the sugar is staying in the blood and building up in the blood. So they're not getting that sugar for energy, but it also can be damaging over time, right? If the blood sugars are too high, it can damage the blood vessels. Well, the benefit of exercise is that it works like really drastically in helping that insulin work better. So it does kind of work like a medicine and that that's the kind of how it helps lower the blood sugars as well. It's, it's really helping the sugar get into the cells more. And so I tell people it's free medicine. You know, we have a slide we do in one of our diabetes classes and it just talks about all the benefits of exercise as far as like increasing energy, you know, lowering blood sugar, lowering cholesterol, lowering your weight, increasing your mood, increasing strength. I always tell people if I had a pill for all the benefits, you know, that this exercise is doing, I would be a millionaire, right? If we had a pill that could do all of this, we we would all want it. So we just have to realize, you know, the benefits for our body and for everybody, but especially people with prediabetes or type 1 or type 2 diabetes as well. Well, with making all of these lifestyle adjustments, Laura, can they change a person's treatment plan? Can these modifications reduce the need for that medication or insulin? Absolutely, for sure. And as diabetes educators, you know, we do see this when people are coming to us and they are motivated and making their changes. 
in their diet, you know, they're often shocked at the improvements they're seeing in blood sugars. And with that comes, maybe we do need a treatment. Maybe we can decrease medicine. If they're on medications that can lower blood sugars, you know, something like certain pills or insulin, and they're making these changes, we often have to tell them that they could be at higher risk of developing a low blood sugar. And if they are getting low blood sugars, you know, a couple times a week to let their doctor know because maybe we need to go down on their insulin or down on their oral medication, which is always a good thing when we can do that. You know, we have a lot of people that don't don't want medicine or want to try to decrease their medicine. And so we work with them on lifestyle, which again is eating, moving more, and losing weight if needed. You know, again, that weight loss recommendation is 7 to 10 percent for people that are overweight or obese with type 2 diabetes. So maybe they need to lose 70 pounds, but even a 15-pound difference can make a difference, lowering their blood sugars and maybe improving their A1C and maybe lowering their medication a little bit. Well, then let's zoom out even more. How can these changes impact long-term complications that are associated with diabetes? Yeah, so these lifestyle changes basically all are working to improve blood sugar control, right? So we know that lowering high blood sugars can decrease risk of complications associated with diabetes. And, you know, we've all heard about these things that diabetes can affect the eyes and the kidneys and and cause neuropathy. And so there was a large study proving that an A1C, hemoglobin A1C, which is a lab value we use to measure blood sugar average, over the past three months. And the goal for that in this study, what came out of this study was that an A1C less than seven is going to decrease risk of complications from diabetes. There's eye problems, kidney problems, you know, nerve problems. We call those the microvascular complications of diabetes. So improved blood sugar really decreases a person's chance. And sometimes when somebody's newly diagnosed with diabetes, we'll see them and they'll tell us their story of, you know, my grandma had diabetes and her leg was amputated and my dad lost his sight. And so they're very scared, obviously, because of what they've seen that diabetes could possibly do. But as educators, what we're teaching them is that, you know, if we keep these blood sugars under control and can improve your sugars and get you at goal, that your chance of getting these complications is decreased significantly. And that's what we want for everybody we see. And, And we have capabilities to control blood sugars a lot better, not just with lifestyle, but obviously with medications if those are needed and new technology as well. So there's a lot of hope for people that have diabetes and education we feel is is key. Knowledge is power to helping control this disease. Another aspect is as far as complications and, you know, how lifestyle can help and just good control can help is we know that heart disease is the leading cause of death among people with diabetes. And so we definitely are very aggressive in trying to control that. So we call that plan the ABCs of diabetes care for heart disease prevention specifically. So A is for A1C. That was that lab value we talked about, trying to keep that A1C less than 7. We know is going to help with this decreased risk of heart disease. B is for blood pressure control. So looking to control their blood pressure, keep that at goal as well. Most of the patients I'm seeing with at least type 2 diabetes have high blood pressure and high cholesterol as well. And so C, as you can imagine, is for cholesterol, so that we are trying to control their cholesterol. And we also throw in smoking cessation in there if they are smokers. We, we know smoking is just such a huge risk factor for heart disease. So we are you know, trying to get people to quit smoking as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, kind of on that note here, Laura, as we wrap up, if someone may struggle with being consistent with their lifestyle modifications, what advice can you offer to help them stay on track? First things first, set yourself up for success. If you are addicted to pop and sugar and chips, these are things that we don't want to keep in the house and surround ourselves by, right? We want to create a healthier environment in the house. So we, you know, get people grocery lists with the right foods to buy and, and starting with that I think is huge. And we also say start small. Even small changes can, can make big big results over time. So something like if somebody's having a bagel or donut at breakfast every day, well, maybe we could try switching up that for a whole wheat English muffin with some nut butter or something like that. Again, like the walking, all you need is a pair of gym shoes. Maybe just try walking. If you're doing no walking, try five minutes and then maybe try five to 10 minutes and try increasing that to twice a day. Try, you know, just some small food changes as well. I have a lot of people 
that have good intentions, but they're just like not doing it. They're you know telling me, oh, I buy a lot of vegetables, but they're going bad before I eat them. So just being more conscious and mindful of, okay, I know I need to try to have vegetables, you know, at lunch and dinner. Let me just start with that. Maybe I'm just going to try to, you know, have a serving of vegetables twice a day, handle those and see if I can start creating new habits. And, and that's what we're looking for, right? You know, we're looking to create these habits that result in a lifestyle change because we know that's what we need for people with diabetes to improve their health is a lifestyle change. Great insight into diabetes management, Laura. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for listening. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels and check out our full podcast library on your favorite podcast app or at dulyhealthandcare.com. This is Duly Noted, a podcast from Duly Health and Care.